My guests today are Kyle Bunting and Joel Hewlin. Gentlemen, how are you? Doing very well. How are you? Doing well. Doing Glad to be great. here. Great. You guys work. You guys work together, right? We do. Yeah. We have. For a lot of years now. <laughs> what do you? What's your day job? Go ahead, Joel. Man, that's a hard one. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> Most of my career, I've been in the career for 26 years. Most of my career was as a developer. Um, but within the last, I want to say five years, I focused more on data and AI and uh, cloud architecture. And my uh, primary uh, expertise in the cloud is in Azure technologies. Uh, the other part of it uh, that I do, and I know Kyle does a lot of as well, is training, uh, training up uh, you know, customers, uh, partner, uh, partners, Microsoft is one of our big customers. We train a lot of Microsoft employees on Azure and, and related services. Yep. And uh, so for me, I, I have a very similar background to Joel, actually. So we, Joel and I met uh, back in 2004. We worked together um, at a, a government location for, for quite some time and then uh, kind of gone partly separate ways and then ended up coming back over the last few years because we're kind of both in the consulting gig. But yep, same thing. I started as a developer. Uh, now I'm primarily over the last few years focused on data and AI, do a lot of data engineering work. Uh, so really just looking at how we how we get data from various locations and be able to get that to a place where we can do uh, big data analytics on that. Uh, well, it's a great time to get into data. It's a uh, uh, that's a good and AI. It's exploding right now as a field, a lot, a lot because of the cloud. Uh, and in fact, um, the reason I want to talk to you is since this is the first time we've met. Uh, my friend Lino introduced us, and he said mm -hmm. you all were experts on data engineering, which Kyle, you just mentioned. Uh, can you tell me what is data engineering? Sure. Uh, so, so data engineering really is is the process of taking. Uh, you know, if, if you think about industries that we have out there, every organization has a lot of data. Uh, many organizations have more data than they know what to do with uh, and are sitting on uh, what I consider to be really one of the most valuable assets that an organization can hold, and that is uh, the information that they have. Uh, data engineering is really the process of being able to take that data from disparate data sources uh, and, and get that into a location, a, a common data store. Uh, so if you take the case of Azure, we typically dump that into a data lake. Uh, and from there, we can, with all this data in the same place, we can now go through a process of uh, doing cleanup on this data. We can do transformation. We can join this data with other data sets that we might have. Uh, and it's really all about getting data to a place where it's ready to be used by data scientists uh, to gain insights from that data uh, so that we can actually make business decisions based on the data that we have. Yep. And, and uh, so you're, you're, go ahead. No, I was just saying you get into a lot of fun terminology like data wrangling and data munging. And, you know, the other thing that you could look at it is data engineering in the industry is a fairly new role. Uh, if you think about the uh, traditional role of a database administrator and uh, developers that support the database administrator in working with the data and doing transformation, a data engineer now uh, covers a lot of those same aspects uh, when it comes to the data portion of it. So they are, that is their job when it comes to integrating with other, uh, you know, uh, services that they have or where is our data coming from? Where is it going? What does it look like? It, or do we have data scientists? And if we do, the data engineer is working with the data scientists to make it ready for model training. Uh, as one of their roles, and are there data analysts, you know, ones that need reporting, that need to be able to uh, work with that information. And so that's really where the data engineer role fits in. And this is something uh, that Microsoft is, is working on formalizing when it comes to Azure, what a data engineer is, what, what the tasks look like. Um, last month, I just went through a job task analysis with Microsoft to help define that role. And then that will turn into official training as well as um, certification to update the current um, data uh, processing data engineer uh, type of certifications. And so it's, it is a hot type of um, role in this industry right now. Yeah, I think you, you mentioned about the 
the value of of information you use that word instead of data. It's a uh, useful information, and then the mm -hmm. consumption of that, the collection of that information, and then the the consumption of it by people that are doing things like uh, artificial intelligence or uh, uh, data analytics. And uh, if I'm hearing you correctly, the data, the role of a data engineer is integration to connect those pieces together. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's that's a big part of it. Uh, you know, and if we think about right when we talk about data. Um, Really, I think over the last few years, we've just, you know, in a lot of organizations, especially when you see the introduction of, of a lot of the IoT devices and, and just all the mobile technologies, things that we have there. Um, one of the big things is in organizations where data engineers are really playing a big role is the shift away from these typical tradition, you know, the, the traditional relational databases that we've seen. So your SQL Server uh, or you know Oracle databases, that kind of stuff, and those still exist, and they're they're probably always still going to exist in some form. But we also now have all of this unstructured data, uh, and unstructured data could be telemetry from IoT devices, it could be images, it could be PDF files you know, all of this different stuff. And so being able to actually start to work with that data and get information out of that as well. Yeah, 90% of today's data is unstructured. And just think about the number of IoT devices, Internet of Things, you know, these are devices that even in your own house, you probably have more than what you even realize. Anytime you install a new dishwasher now, you have to connect it to your Wi-Fi network as an example. You know, that's one example of an IoT device so we have a pro proliferation of these devices. They're all generating telemetry. That telemetry is considered unstructured data. It could be in different schemas. It could be in different formats. And that's just one thing. And then we have mobile devices and we have text messages. We have log files that are being generated. That's why that figure of 90% of that data being unstructured. And then in the last two years, we have accumulated 90% of the world's data just in the last two years. So we have this exponential growth. And when you look at what is big data, you know, traditionally when people think of big data, it's, well, it's a lot of data. Well, yeah, that's only one of the four aspects. There's the four Vs. There's, um, you know, there's the, the, uh, the uh, volume, which is the big part that you're familiar with. Uh, there is the variety, so that you have unstructured, you have structured, you have semi-structured, the velocity, so it could be data that's coming in uh, in different speeds, so you can have real-time and near real-time data, you have batch data, now you have to somehow process all of that and keep up with the real-time, and that is a separate type of problem, and then you have veracity. Veracity is, well, this data isn't really reliable all the time. It could be due to human error. It could be due to bad data from a sensor. Um, and when you're looking at the role of, of a data engineer, most often you've, your data falls in one of those categories. And so it is a big data problem. And you're having to now find what are the tools that I use to deal with that variety of speed, of volume, of uh, problematic files. Um, and and so this is where uh, the other part of, of what we do for on our day to day jobs is to work with customers to solve these problems, but also help train uh, mainly within Microsoft, um, you know, employees on new things like Synapse Analytics. You know, that is a great tool for for handling these types of problems. Uh, tell me about some of the tooling that you use for handling this. You mentioned uh, Synapse Analytics. What is that? Yeah, and so Synapse Analytics is a unified platform uh, in Azure that you run. And by unified, that means if I'm a data engineer, if I'm a data scientist, if I'm a data analyst, you know, uh, this is the promise of this is a single tool that all of these different um, types of, of people go into to work with the information. and so traditionally, um, it's it's a replacement of Azure Data Warehouse, which is an MPP or massively parallel processing platform, uh, which is your traditional data warehouse. Uh, it's SQL based and sorting information in there. So then Microsoft decided to expand upon that. So Synapse Analytics is a replacement of that, but in the form of these provision dedicated SQL pools. But then they're adding a lot of other things. So you have unstructured data, they add Apache Spark. 
So you have these serverless Spark pools where you can work with that unstructured data at a massive scale uh, for, for preparing it, doing the transformations. Um, there's also the other serverless pool. It's called uh, SQL or serverless SQL pools. And so this allows, this is an extension of Polybase, which st started coming out really in 20, 2016 in that version of SQL Server to work with flat files using T-SQL. Transact SQL. So this is a newer version of that. It's much more performant. It's built into the system. You can right click on a file in your data lake and say create SQL query and then it connects to it and you can start exploring it. And so it has those tools built into it. And then on the Azure Data Factory side, which is still another product for orchestrating and creating pipelines for data movement and transformation, that code base is built into Synapse. Uh, in the form of Synapse pipelines. And then you have on the other end with the visualization, Power BI, which is a visualization service, is also integrated into Synapse. So you have direct access to your workspace. You can view your reports in your workspace right in Synapse. You can edit them and create new data sets without ever leaving this, this one Synapse Studio, which is a web-based thing. And so that's like from a very high-level view, the set of tools that are part of there as well, services that really help you with that end-to-end -end type of uh, work that you need to do. Right, and I think I would just kind of say on top of that, right? I think that you know, so Synapse Studio is is the the tool that we use to kind of get into this, and it really does. It's it's Microsoft's step towards providing a, a single platform where data engineers, data scientists, data analysts can go in. Uh, and, and do everything they need to do within that platform. Um, so instead of having, you know, uh, historically, even within Azure, what we've had to do is is piecemeal a bunch of different tools together to accomplish all of right. this. So Synapse Studio uh, and Azure Synapse Analytics is their way of kind of combining all of these tools together into a single uh, unified platform. Is it fair to say that uh, Synapse Analytics isn't really a new thing, that it's but rather that it's taking things like uh, what was Azure Data Warehouse, uh, the uh, Power BI, Azure Data Factory, and then bundling them together, just making them easier to integrate. Is, is that a fair statement? Uh, or I, add I would, something else on top of that? Yeah, I, I don't know that I would say that it's, it, it definitely is a combination of a lot of tools that, that existed previously, uh, but I think it's, it's more than that um, because I, I, I think the combination of all those things and the way that they're put together, uh, the, the tight integration of those really does make it a new product because so I can, okay. uh, you know, I could use Synapse uh, Analytics uh, without turning on the, the dedicated SQL pool or the data warehouse feature. Um, so, so what we would traditionally have called Azure Data Warehouse um, I, I don't have to, to enable that feature. Um, but the great thing within Azure Synapse is that I can have both a, a serverless SQL pool and a dedicated SQL pool um, so that the serverless pool really, as a data engineer especially, allows me to run uh, T-SQL-based queries against my the files that I have in my data lake. So I can now use a very familiar syntax to query data uh, without it actually living in a database. Uh, so I can go directly against that data warehouse. Uh, and then for my heavier uh, analytics workloads uh, for reporting and that kind of stuff, uh, that's where I could then use the, the dedicated SQL pool um, to, to handle that. So that's going to be you know, just much more performant. I can scale that according to what my workload might look like. Uh, the other benefit from a cost perspective is that I can also turn that off. So even if I do spend that up, I can pause that dedicated SQL pool uh, and only pay for it when I'm using it. Uh, so that one of the other things they've done here is they've, uh, which is different than your traditional data warehouses, they've separated the compute from the storage. Yeah, and, and the other thing too that's new, that's unique to Synapse Analytics, is the fact that there's this thing called Synapse Link. And what Synapse Link is, is it's a, uh, a feature within Synapse where you're integrating uh, very tightly with other Azure services. So uh, the first example that they have out there uh, right now is Azure Cosmos DB. You know, that's the big globally available NoSQL uh, database system. Mm -hmm that you can use and you can store JSON documents, you can store you know, MongoDB type, type of data and, and these other APIs. And so one of the challenges that you have as an organization is if you are using Cosmos DB, um, you're, you're using it as a transactional database and every single time, the, the way that uh, you pay for it is through usage, it's compute. So you're paying for RUs and you do mm -hmm. pay a small amount for storage. 
So if you want to run heavy analytical queries against that, um, and we're talking about, you know, let's get all the data that we have and really start digging into it and exploring it. Well, traditionally that could be cost prohibitive and you're going against your allocated resources, your resource units. And so Synapse Link, if you have Synapse and you have Cosmos DB and you enable this, you have this analytical store and where you would traditionally say, okay, let's go ahead and use the change feed to automatically generate these parquet files and dump them out to a data lake. And then we can query against those without paying you know, for access against Cosmos. Well, that's done for you automatically. So underlying hidden from you is this whole data store, this analytical data store in columnar format, which are basically parquet files. And you can go into Spark or you can go into Transact SQL and you can go against all of your data within those containers and it's not counting it against your resource units. So you're not paying for transaction against it. It's very fast. And the only way you can get this feature is with Synapse Analytics. And it's through this, this Synapse Link type of feature. And you'll see additional resources that are uh, coming out in the future that use that type of integration. But that is a unique thing that you won't get anywhere else. Um, and then the, the Apache Spark side of it uh, is also interesting because we have an integration with Azure Machine Learning Service um, to make it easy to really use that. Um, and, and so, yeah, I would say in a way it is fair to say it is a rehash of some existing things, but it is very much a new product. Got it. Yeah, yeah. I'm fascinated by this. Uh, this the uh, Synapse Studio sounds analogous to Visual Studio. What that was for developers, this is for data engineers. In other words, when I was when I was a full time developer, what I would do is in the first thing in the morning, I would open up Visual Studio, and I wouldn't leave it until five o'clock because that's where all my tooling was. I could sure. work with just about anything, and Microsoft kept on adding tools for different uh, languages and different uh, uh, platforms and frameworks and plugins for all sorts of things. It sounds like Synapse Studio is kind of uh, analogous to that. Analogous, yeah. but all web-based. Right, all web-based, web -based, yeah. yeah. For now. No, I think, I think that's a good analogy. And if you think about it, you know, from a data engineering perspective, uh, you know, I have the ability with Synapse Pipelines to do handle my data ingestion. Uh, and I could do that a few ways, which is, uh, you know, in some cases, just a straight copy of data from one place to another. Uh, I also have the ability to do transformations of that data. So if I want to, in the process of moving that data, uh, restructure that data in some way or do some cleanup on that data because I know certain fields are always going to be null or whatever that might look like, uh, you know, I have mapping data flows that I can use inside of that to handle some of those transformations. Uh, but I also think one of the, the great things that we can do is once we have those files, uh, and basically the, the common data store for Synapse is gonna be Azure Data Lake. Uh, and, and once we have those files in there, uh, through Synapse Studio, uh, I can explore those using T-SQL. And as Joel said, it's as simple as right-clicking a file and say, I want to um, you know, just, I, I want to select the top 100 and then I can go in and I can write whatever you know, SQL queries that I want against those files. Uh, I can also uh, bring those into an external table if I want. Um, so I can work with those actually as a table, uh, not as a file. Uh, but then the other thing that I think is very powerful from a data engineering perspective, and, and we actually just uh, dealt with this with one of our customers, <laughs> Uh, is that you can also, in addition to right-clicking that file and, and uh, opening it up in a you know, SQL query, is I can open it up in a Spark notebook. Uh, so now I have all the power of Spark to be able to, and the scalability of Spark, uh, right. you know, to do parallel jobs so that I can actually now do much more advanced um, transformations of my data and, and even querying of my data. Um, or if I have problems with some of the files that I have, uh, I have a, a much stronger toolkit for fixing uh, and correcting the files that I'm working with. One of the challenges I've always had with working with data is um, source control. How do you deal with the sharing information and backing up and versioning all of the, the, the code and all the work you're doing? Yeah, and, and so that's really, we still don't have, I mean, we've got some uh, 
DevOps type of stuff, I think, coming into the data world, but it's still not really defined. Uh, but typically how we handle that in, in the a data engineering perspective uh, is how we actually store and structure our data. Uh, so when we write the data out to the data lake, uh, you know, typically what we want to do is we want to take the raw data uh, and we, we, we pretty much never, uh, unless we don't have another option, we never want to work with data directly from uh, the source that it's coming from. We always want to bring a copy of that over into the data lake. Uh, it's just more scalable. Uh, and a lot of times analytics workloads are very process intensive and we don't want to bring down a production system uh, working with that. So we'll bring the data over in its raw format into the data lake. Uh, and then we'll go through a series of enrichment process. And a lot of times that raw form, you know, when we bring that raw data over, we want to keep it in a format that's compatible with other systems uh, as well as as close to the source system as possible. And that might be XML, it might be CSV files, JSON files, right? There's We have a lot of different options there. Uh, but as we go through the process of doing uh, transformations on that data or, you know, various enrichments, say we want to join two data sets together, um, this is where we can start to do this. And we basically build out, build out folder structures. So as we go through those, uh, each, each level of folder structure will contain a different level of enrichment of that data or transformation of that data. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of how we do the versioning is we just kind of almost make copies of the data where we've added new things to it or we've reshaped that in some way. Uh, and then from a access control perspective, one of the great things that we get with it with Azure Data Lake is that we can actually control uh, permissions down to the file level. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we wanted to say that, hey, my you know, my data scientists don't need to get at, you know, data at a certain level. I only want them to work with this. I can actually set up groups and I can assign permissions to a folder uh, and, and just let them get at that data so that, you know, they, we don't have to worry about individuals going in there and modifying the raw data or other steps along the way where we're dealing with the transfer, the transformations of that data. Yeah. And as, and from a, a source control standpoint, there is a built in capability uh, that just came out. I just noticed it last week in mm -hmm. Synapse Analytics where if you go into Synapse Studio, you'll see uh, Synapse Live, you know, and they hit the drop down and it tells you, oh, set up a Git repository if you haven't already. If so, mm -hmm. then what you see is your repository. And so if you're familiar with using Azure Data Factory, it has the same kind of concept where you can have an underlying uh, Git repository, which is mm -hmm. maybe backed up, backed in Azure DevOps, for instance. Um, and so any changes that you do when you're within that repository mode is uh, captured and then you commit that, you know, so now I have a new version of my changes and then I can have branches of my own. And so all of the artifacts that you work with in Synapse Studio can all be expressed within YAML or JSON files, for instance, mm -hmm. like these pipelines you're creating, uh, these different things like, um, Notebooks have their own types, like their their Jupyter notebooks. You have .SQL files, and so you have all of these artifacts that are there. And so now you can start having some of those capabilities. And Microsoft is working hard to really expand that story of it. So then you have more of this collaborative environment. Um, and, and so I think that will help with in, in conjunction with what Kyle was saying with working with your data in a way that makes sense for uh, isolation of these different uh, stages of transformation, then you can start having a real clear story on what that looks like. Um, we've covered a lot here. What, uh, is there anything <laughs> we haven't talked about that we should have? Um, well, I, I guess one one thing I would say is just, uh, you know, in the Spark world, I think one of the very interesting, especially, uh, you know, with your background as a developer, uh, this is the first environment that I've seen where we can now actually use C Sharp in uh, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, which oh, which is pretty cool. Um, so, uh, you know, yes. we, right? Uh, so that's actually a pretty cool feature. Uh, we've done a little bit with that, uh, kind of demoing that to, to some individuals and just, you know, for developer groups, showing them that, hey, you now have this capability. You don't have to know Python or Scala. Uh, you know, and there's still some things that you, you would want to know around that. Um, but, you know, with Microsoft just kind of always looking at kind of building out what languages can we can we use here and how can we, we make this more friendly for the skill sets that we have out there in the Microsoft world? Yeah. And, and your primary languages, I think, for data engineering uh, comes down to a lot of Python and a lot of SQL. So that could be Spark SQL, it could be Transact SQL. Those are the top two, but 
within notebooks is what Kyle was saying. You could do Python, you could do Scala, you could do uh, SQL syntax, you could do C sharp syntax. But one of the big things that we've been um, really, uh, you know, going over and emphasizing when doing training on Synapse for for Microsoft is, you know, the modern data engineer needs to get out of the mindset of I need to use SQL for absolutely everything. You know, there's yeah, this whole other world that. out there's this whole other world out there that really can make your job easier. Something that could take you, you know, dozens of lines to do in SQL, you could do in one or two lines in some cases using something like Python, because there's a big uh you know open source library out there to to be able to right pull down and, and use as part of your toolkit. And so part of this is just looking at the problem in different ways. And something like Synapse gives you all of those in one place. So then it's a little more uh, easily discoverable. Like, let me see what this tool does. Oh, I can right click and it starts a new notebook. Oh, there's a little help link here. And then you you start having an environment where you can you can play with those things. And, oh, you know what? I could do stuff maybe easier here if I'm doing a lot of transformations. And really, that's just a mind a mindset uh, shift that we definitely encourage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I would say too that the especially with the, the Spark Notebooks and Synapse, uh, they've made it pretty easy. Uh, so, you know, it, it, traditionally, if I was going to go do some work uh, with data in my data lake, and I was going to use Databricks, uh, for example, uh, you know, I have to go through the process of getting the, the keys for my uh, data lake account, I have to go through, do a bunch of configuration in order to actually make the connection between my notebook uh, and, and my Databricks workspace and that, that data lake environment. Uh, within Synapse, that's all pre-configured for you. So you already have your connection from your notebooks to your data lake. Uh, all of that is set up so you really can just immediately jump into querying the data in your data lake. Yep, that whole single sign-on experience. Exactly. Yep. Oh, another great uh, reason for using a unified tool like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, excellent. Uh, we're just about at time, and I want to thank you guys for joining me today. I've learned a lot. And uh, before we go, what's a good place for people to learn more on about data engineering in general and Synapse Analytics in particular? Uh, Synapse Analytics, I would say probably uh, you know, the Microsoft documentation, or you can uh, give a plug to Soliance here. You can come to Soliance. We are actually one of the leaders uh, right now uh, with Microsoft and, and actually developing sure. the training for this. What's What's the URL there? Uh, it's www.soliance.net. That's S O L L I A N C E. Solution Alliance. Soliance. Uh, but you could also look uh, for official training um, in the Microsoft Learn uh, platform. So if you go to the Docs site in Azure, you'll see links to to Microsoft Learn, and there's a whole learning path for for uh, data engineering using different services. So that's another good starting point. Great. Joel, Kyle, thank you so much. You two stay safe. All right. Thank you for having us. Thanks. All right. I'd like to thank uh, you for giving us the opportunity to come on here today uh, and talk about uh, technology uh, through a, a shared mutual friend, uh, Lino Tadros. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you very much.